Hi, I'm Joe Johnson, and I'm the senior pastor here at Goffstown Harvest Christian Church, and I'm glad you're checking out our program, which we call His Kingdom Now. You know, when Jesus walked on the earth, He was clear. He didn't come to bring another religion. He came to open up a relationship with God through the kingdom of heaven. And the most amazing news about this is we have access to that kingdom just as much as He does. And so what we're going to do today as we open up the Word of God is we're going to find out how the stuff works. We're going to learn what He said, how to cooperate with His kingdom, so that all of us can walk with God and see amazing things, not just in this generation, but we can know for sure that we can live with Him forever and ever. So enjoy the service. I look forward to talking to you at the end. Praise God. Well, it's, <laughs> it's good to see everybody today. Merry Christmas. And um, it, it's good to see everybody be with you. We talked about, there's actually, I know, you know, a bunch of churches that, you know, took today off from service. And, and I get that. I thought about it. I saw the, I even saw the weather last night and the icing is like, you know what, that kind of would have been nice. But you know what's nicer is even if there was one of you just being here together uh, as a family. And it's, it's not a religious love that says, I want to love you because Jesus told me I had to. But every, every day would be an exaggeration. I am regularly aware that my love for you guys is increasing more and more. And during the season, one of the things that he's really been working with me, and I've got a, still a bunch of time on this, is, you know, my personality. You know, you ever heard of, uh, what do they call those things you take for as far as your skill levels, uh, strength finders? Like, achievers, my number one thing. Like, I'm just, I'm just, when I get done with something else, I don't even take time to enjoy the victory. I just got 10 other mountains I got to go conquer. Well, that's not healthy. And there's things you get done, but you miss, and most importantly, you miss the people that were with you to cause that, that win, right? And so um, during this time in these years, you know, I'm intentional on learning on how to stay in first gear. I'm not thinking about anything else, but just being with you guys and just because fifth gear in uh, the McLaren is 210 miles per hour, and that's about right with Joe Johnson. So I'm staying in first gear and just enjoying. And so being here today, you know, we knew it'd be light, but, you know, there's folks that either don't have anything else, they need a family, but just for me personally, I just love more and more just being with you all. And um, to me, this is just a great treat. We're not going to go with talking about first gear um, as I was, you know, had some ideas for things that I was going to talk about. And I told some of you, I'll get, don't put the title slide up, but um, to the title of today, if you want to call it a message, is the God of the weenie whistle. <laughs> and if you were here last week, you recognize that I, you know, some things I got to do last weekend out in Frankfurt, Germany were I knew the creator of the universe had specifically set up a trip for me, and we'll you know talk about that here in a little bit. But as well, I don't know if you had a chance to mention a Christian, but um, on the uh, our first crossing heading out to Germany, um, you know, my friends, and I say this regularly, that we need to understand that provision is about mission. And what I mean by that, if God meets all your needs according to your riches and glory, then the issue is not having it work, it's being at the work you're supposed to be at because there's people that are supposed to be in your life. When you're missional, provision is not an issue. Well, aviation for me is very missional for me. Not only do I have a blast, but where I'm going with that is one more time, the guy I was flying with, the chief, uh, the, the lead pilot on, um, the, for the company that I contracted for uh, is the son of a pastor. And uh, really, really good guy, but like a lot of, now I've been very fortunate in our children, we were honest with them, and they've all lived to tell the story about living as PKs, uh, but that isn't true for a lot of sons of preachers. And so, you know, there's things there and questions, and there was a window. We were, oh, we were 30, 40 west on the way, heading out in the middle of the North Atlantic, and we had about a two and a half hour, really intense, and I'm not talking about theology and pounding the table and stuff, but just heart-revealing discussions of the gospel. 
And the third person that, that, uh, that came with us on the overseas trips, I guess they normally bring their director of maintenance. His name is Tom. And during the entire time, you could just, because you know we would be up front and he's sitting in the jump seat, and just intensely listening, potentially for the first time, because if you get around me, you're going to hear the gospel, no matter how we bring it around. So I was very well aware that not only was I you know, being blessed as far as the trip and all those other things, that uh, we're constantly in mission mode. And I was very well aware that that trip was a lot more than just to bless me. It was to be able to sow into people's lives. And you know, the Apostle Paul said this, and I'll talk about some lessons I've learned through the years as we talk about the God of the weenie whistle. If you'd learn this from me, if you keep your eyes open, you'd be amazed at the divine appointments that the Master will set up for you. And if you're aware, you'll think, well, Pastor, I don't know how to evangelize. You don't need to th- stop thinking like that. Just, just love the Lord, do what you do with the best of your heart, and be open, and you'll be amazed at the doors that will naturally not have to be forced open. They'll be as easy and natural as breathing, and you'll conversationally be able to share your heart and your experiences so that people can get an accurate understanding of the Lord through your life, not just telling them, here, go read a book that in their minds, uneducated minds, is a 2,000-year-old book. What's that got to do for me? And so some things I want to talk about today, and I determined as, you know, and again, I like to teach, so even the verses I was looking at, you know, I was praying the Holy Ghost, putting it all together this morning, and I'm just like, you know, I could go down this road, and I could really hit this, and I get stay in first gear, Johnsick. So today is just going to be some things I want to remind us, going in, in, and also going into next year. Next, uh, uh, next Sunday, we're going to pick back up our Principles of Prosperity series, the Jesus teachings, and Jesus had a lot to talk about, uh, uh, talents, money, stewardship, responsibility, and I believe what we talked about this morning was just going to wake some things up for you to dream and expect bigger than you ever thought possible. Because our God is a God that's bigger than anything you thought possible. And as his sons, if he's dad, he's invited us because we're sons now. Uh, we say this regularly, heaven is our living room. Like we've got a whole different set of culture and architecture we're supposed to get used to. Like the inheritance of the children of God. Think about this. There's, if, you can, if I can use the illustration, you, there's a bank account that never runs out of money. It never runs out. It doesn't matter what your needs are. It doesn't matter what your problems are. You could be in the middle of a prison. No one can pay your bail, but you know what? You start worshiping Jesus, and all of a sudden there's an earthquake and all the doors open. And at the end of the day, you end up getting the jailer saved and his entire family, and God uses it to bless people. I mean, you could sit there, you could be in the middle of, of the ocean, about to shipwreck, have your cruise ship split in pieces, and an angel shows up and says, tell everybody they're going to be fine. I mean, we have resources that are beyond any world limitation. Powers. We're supposed to know the exceeding greatness of his power that's towards us who believe. We remember that series when we were talking about having this mind in you, which was in Christ Jesus. And we were talking about the heart set of the Apostle Paul. If I raise your hand, if I ask you, as a matter of fact, I'll ask you one question. How many of y'all want to know Jesus more? Who wants to know? Of course you want to know Jesus more. Do you think Paul wanted to know Jesus more? Well, remember when we taught about this, knowing Jesus more is only half the biblical equation. Because the Apostle Paul said, I've lost everything that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Just knowing Jesus without his power is incomplete. As a matter of fact, you can't know him fully if you also don't know his powers as well. Once again, going into 2022, as certainly challenges increase uh, out there in the world, there's no enigma, there's no lack, there's no disease, there's no tribulation, there's nothing that the power and resources of our God cannot absolutely overwhelm. And so this is going to be a good morning. What I want to do is I want to share some things from last week. I did have some fun. I want you guys to see what I got, uh, what I had a chance to do because it was just, well, basically flipping awesome. And I want you to see how awesome it is. And yeah. So today, the God of the weenie was, now how many are you familiar? You've seen the Santa Claus and you know, the, okay, we'll watch one of the scenes here in a minute. And what I want to do is before we, and I want to talk about how, remember how shocked they were, and we're going to see the scene here in a minute to where 
uh, he and his wife talked about when they were children how their dreams and their faith was broken because they so expected and wanted something and it didn't come to pass. And I'm going to help us with that today because there isn't anybody in this room that hasn't had that experience where you believed, you trusted, you expected, and nothing happened. Okay, so this is going to be, again, going into next year, really, really important. But just a couple things show you what I got to do last week. Um, now, what was so special about this trip? Now, this is Maine. Okay, up through here is Gander and Halifax and Greenland and Iceland. What they, when you want to go over to Europe and why this was so special. Now, I've been to Europe before in the Falcon. Uh, what, I would, what we did is we took what they call special or northern routes. The problem with that is it ends up adding hours to your trip is you have to come up through here and you follow and go up. Basically, we flew over Greenland and over Iceland and came on down. This right here is called the North Atlantic Track System. Now, why this was such a blessing and so cool, and I got a video of us over the North Atlantic flying the track system. What the uh, Agencies from not just the United States, but up in Shannon and Scotland and all, they come together and every day, what they do is they look at the weather, they look at the winds, and they put out what they call the North Atlantic track system. And what they do is they've geared it so when you file to go over, and I was in Frankfurt, Germany, I'll show you the route that we took, is what we did was is we came over here, gassed up in Halifax, hit Elser, 50 north, 53 north, and brought it all the way over to Dugal. And then we ended up going over Ireland, uh, was that France, and then over uh, to uh, Germany. Now, why this was such a, a trait to me, to be able to do this and to be able to fly the North Atlantic track system, a couple things you have to have. First of all, you have to have the most advanced avionics. Like, it doesn't get any better anymore as far as uh, what they call it is a CPDLC, Control Pilot Data Link. Uh, and what it allows us to do before they had any of that, you would talk to control on what they call an HF, free, HF frequency. HF radio has been around, I think, since the 20s or something like that. And uh, you would normally, and you'd have to check in and so on and so forth. Well, what you can do now is you can, can you, out here in the middle of nowhere using satellites, you can now communicate with all of the controllers, communicate, get directions, and, 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 and follow what they need you to do, where you're at, all of your reporting. See, remember, there's no, uh, there's, because there's no radio stations, out here, they don't know where you're at until you have position reporting. You have to file not only your altitude, you're filing your flight speed, and you have positional reporting, and as they're tracking everybody, they can tell by when you tune in and when you report how separated you are. Well, you have to have, to be able to do this today, you have to have the best of the best there's requirements to flying the tracks and not everybody has this equipment so number one the reason why this was such a blessing to me as a pilot is I got to play with the best of the best and it was a school to be able to use now we I, I have the same flight management system a Challenger 605 is a Challenger 605 it's the same flight management system but it doesn't have the abilities because we just don't do this and so A, as a, as a pilot, and getting to work with the greatest, latest and greatest, that was a real blessing to me. As well, to be able to do these things, you have to train every two years. And I have trained year, every two years I got recurrent in international operations. Well, a lot of those things that you train in, we never used it because I never flew the track system. So all of those things that I've learned through the years, I actually, for the first time, had a chance to be able to work with them. And so, again, it was really amazing. Now, people say, well, what if you're over 53 west and something really bad happens? Like, if you look, there's like nothing there. And so what you also have to do, and they don't have it on this chart, you have what they call equal time points. Another thing you've got to prepare for, and you've got to be ready as far as procedurally. What an equal time point is, is if you have, there's three contingencies that if you run into a problem, you lose an engine, you lose pressurization, or if there's something else, like someone gets sick and you've got to go somewhere. People will ask, well, what happens if something breaks on your way out here? An equal time point is if something breaks at this point, your, you, it's been figured on the flight management system and uh, the programming for the flight where you will go if you have a contingency. In other words, if we're here and we have a rapid depressurization, which means now i got to leave flight level, we flew out at 37,000 uh, feet, and i got to fly down at 10,000 feet over the middle Atlantic, I have to know where I can go and how much gas 
I would have if I was there. So I'll share that with you guys. If you're, uh, if you, when you fly overseas, you go to another country and you start feeling, because I remember way, way, way back when I first started doing this stuff, I'm telling you, it's really weird being out over the middle of just black, okay? But rest assured, you are not allowed. Now, way, 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 way back, they used to have a thing called a wet footprint. Now, wet footprint was a, was a space in rooting where if you lost something there, you're not making it anywhere. You can't do that anymore, not just with technology, but the ability of, our, of the equipment. You don't have wet footprints. So if you go to Hawaii, like we get to do in March, thank you very much, or you guys end up going to Europe and you're like three hours out over the ocean going, you know, I wonder what would happen if something breaks, you'd be fine. But my responsibility as a pilot, again, getting to do all of these things is making sure we had all those in there. They were programmed. We ta- Every time you go over an equal time point, we brief. All right, we have this we go here. Any questions? We have this, we go here. Any questions? It's just a, just a completely different level of expertise you have to have when you do these things. So it was just really, really, really great and a real blessing. So that's what I got to do as a pilot, a couple pictures, and then uh, we'll get... And by the way, I, this is before what I'm going to say because this relates what I'm going to say. Okay? So... This is me in front of the uh, uh, hotel. It's a, it was a Marriott property. And uh, Rob was like, what's it look like out there? It looks like Europe. If you've ever been to Europe, it looks like Europe. They all just the architecture, excuse me, the vibe. Everything is a whole lot smaller. It's Europe. Um, this is, I wanted you guys so that next time I have to fly and do this, that you'll pray for me. <laughs> the catering... <laughs> <laughs> was uh, grilled lamb chops and specially seasoned potatoes and tiramisu for dessert and all. I just wanted you to know how terrible it is when you're up there <laughs> and you're crossing the mid-Atlantic. I think, did I have another picture here? Okay. No, all right. So the first, it's just a couple videos. They're real, real short. Uh, the first one, pull up the one at Frankfurt. Just, I got a good shot of, uh, of uh, an A3 900 massive plane landing and then another one taking off. This is at Frankfurt. I'm standing by our airplane. And you can see they just line them up. It's like an assembly line of airplanes coming in, taking off. And that's what I fly in. That is a big airplane. So as a pilot, that's what I see out on the ramp. Now, this is inside the cockpit. Hold on a second before you get pl- when you bring the next one up. And this is so you can see. Now, you, uh, uh, you'll see another plane on the track system. And it took me a minute to zoom in. But you'll see how close we are, even out in the middle of the Atlantic. And then I show you the avionics. And I'll, I'll, I'll point you to where I was at. And I'm flying. I'm the captain on this flight, bringing us back. This is Shannon to White Plains, New York. And then, but... Oh. All right, and uh, and then you'll see what the ocean looks underneath, and then we'll get to work as far as the word of God. Go ahead. That's my cockpit. That's me taking the picture. That's where we're at. In the middle of nowhere. And I'm zooming it in so you can see. There's Greenland right up front. The pastor's the captain.
six hours. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, so when someone says, oh, I heard your pastor fly his airplanes. <laughs> Say, no, you don't get it. <laughs> and so one last time, as I've been saying regularly, there's a number of you guys that have been with us for 20-something years. I do this, Dick, because you've been stuck with me as my friends all of these years. And it's imperative, and I'll continually remind that when I talk about uh, the blessings we have today. It's because so many of us grew up together, cut each other some slack. By the church, you probably learn how to cut each other a lot more slack than we do, me thinkest. And uh, we've grown up, and I trust that you rejoice in what we've been able to accomplish as much as I do. So back to the God of the weenie whistle. What I want to do is, is I want to show you the scene from the Santa Claus. Now, I've got this here for those of you watching live stream. Copy that. Because we know that all those trolls and algorithms by uh, Big Brother are watching. And the moment they hear the first words out of this video I'm going to show, you know what they're going to do? They're going to shut it down because that's what we do. We're being watched and spied on all the time. Thank you, NSA, and all you hard workers out there. So what I want you to do is, if you'll look at this, it's a minute, it's a minute and 40-something second clip. You can go ahead and get a copy of that. And I want to use this now to talk about and give from, and Christian and Lacey were actually saying, they, all, they were just recently saying, you know, some scenes from that Santa Claus would make a really great sermon. Well, again, this is where we get the weenie whistle thing. So you've had time to copy that. So now if you will bring the video up and hit pause on the broadcasting for the minute and 48 seconds or whatever this is, 22 seconds, let's go ahead, turn the lights down and let's watch the scene and we'll get started with the word of God. And what I want to talk about today is, is there anybody in here who like Neil you believed, you expected, and many folks, and listen, this doesn't have to be just, this doesn't have to necessarily be with God. This can be with people. This can be with your parents. This can be with your friends. You expected, you believed, you were tried, and she's like, and Neil's like, I was three. And there's folks, man, there's things that happen to us even when we're really young that cause these holes to get in our heart, and they make it very difficult, if not impossible, to believe. Let alone, and, and really that gets bad when we, have a very, when we have a difficult time trusting in our Heavenly Father, who by the time we're done is going to be abundantly clear how good He is. And these are things that don't have to happen again in our lives. And uh, going into next year, and again, as we talk about blessings and responsibility, this morning, very light first gear, not a lot of teaching, but I want to help you this morning going into next year that if you were three, like Neil, and something happened, and you got a hole in your heart, and you, for what, you can't believe, you can't, it was taken from you, I want to help you with some principles that I've learned serving God over 40 years. Uh, 30 years in the ministry, and um, weenie whistles are a regular occurrence in my life. It didn't used to be. It used to be wide gaps between, but now they keep coming, and the latest was this flight, and there is a science to putting yourself in a position so in, in having and in being healed from those things that have happened, and so Remember our coaching moments. In this life, we all have dreams that seemingly do not come true. And for many of us, our faith has been challenged, even relinquished as a result. And I want to help folks today. I want to help you, those of you watching by live stream, or uh, you'll be watching the uh, video here in a while. This, the end game of this service is if you've if your faith has been challenged, let alone you've just walked away from stuff because of ne the Neil experiences in your life, I'm here to help you and give you some things to get you right back on track. Let's look at the Word of God. Simple stuff. Most of these verses, I don't think, matter of fact, you shouldn't be surprised by the three or four verses I used today. You should have heard them before. Again, I'm staying in first gear, sharing some things that I've learned through the years. 
Habakkuk 2, 1 through 3. I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower. Now, what was happening was this guy had a lot of questions about God. As a matter of fact, if you're Neil here today, I would suggest you take a look at that book of Habakkuk because it starts with this, uh, with these questions before God. What happened? Why are we not? Excuse me. Why are we not seeing these things? I'm getting frustrated. But notice, and for the sake of time, I didn't put all of that there. What he did was, he says, I will take my stand at my watch post, station myself on the tower, and look out to see, not if, but what he will say to me. The word of God recognizes that you will have questions, you're going to have frustrations, there's going to be things you do not understand, but notice he was intentional and proactive to go, I may not understand right now what's happening, but I'm going to, I know he's going to answer me. I know he's going to answer me. How many, how many of you all know can quote me a verse about if anybody lacks this, do this, and you get that? Raise your hand if you can tell me what I'm quoting. Glenn, you know what I'm talking about? Okay, yes. Of God, okay, who gives liberally and without reproach, but let him ask in faith. So in other words, if anybody lacks wisdom, and he says anybody, he didn't just say the scholar or the theologian, Anyone, if you are a son, a child of the Most High God, you're an anyone in context, and you are allowed to ask God for wisdom, the ability to understand. He's just expecting to you, but let him ask in faith. That's what this guy's doing. He's not wondering if God's going to say anything. He was determined because he knew God was going to answer him. God wants to answer you why you don't have a weenie whistle. He wants to answer that to you. He wants to answer what happened way, way, way back when. He wants to help you. He wants to help you today in your business. He wants to help me continually in my ministry and my walk with him. There's regular questions that I have. My job is not to be whimsical. I'll use that word here in just a little bit and just go, well, okay, sera, sera, whatever it will be. Maybe he'll just talk to me. No, he was intentional and purposefully said, I'm going to hear from God. So first thing I want to encourage you is just don't play around with God. He'll answer you, but don't play around with him. Like, you know, call him on being an honest being. He says, look, I'm going to tell you, you need wisdom. Just ask of me. You just got to believe just like this guy did. So let's see what else he did. He says, and I'm going to look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, there he is, write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time, it hastens to the end, but it will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it, it will surely come, it will not delay. So the next thing is, is not only... and. Um, and this would be kind of be similar. One of the things, that, and you see this regularly. You remember when the Apostle Paul was talking to the church, uh, and, and it was in uh, the church in Thessalonica, when he was talking about ministry of the Spirit, and he says, and do not despise prophecies. In other words, look, you're going to keep the good stuff, throw away the bad stuff. That means you can operate in prophecy and still miss it. There's a lot of people that misunderstand New Testament prophecy. They try to equate it to Old Testament prophecy and prophetic gift. It doesn't work that way. He says, you're going to hear some stuff. People are going to say, let's say it's the Lord. That's a bunch of cow manure. Throw it away. But then there's real good stuff. Why did I bring that up? I'm wondering today, and I want to make sure, <laughs> I want to make sure I'm not hypocritical. I can do it. I'm, yeah. Yeah. The la at least the last few times I remember generally what was said. How many of you all remember when I've operated prophetically and began to declare over, it was probably about a month ago, two months ago. How many of you wrote those words down and studied them and paid attention to what the Lord was saying? See, when we, what happens is we become very, very casual with the gifts and with, oh, God moved and he spoke through pastor. He spoke through someone here. Yeah. A week later, do you remember what he said? And see what he's saying here in the same principle, he's like, look, what I'm telling you, he says, put this thing down so you don't forget this. Put this thing down, meaning how many of you, well, you don't have to raise your hand, but just, so I'm going to rephrase how I say this. If you've counseled with me, especially when it comes to praying and seeking God, okay, I know I can point you out, Matthew. One of the first things I say is make sure you have a journal. Make sure you got a piece of paper and a pen, and all I'm encouraging and instructing folks to do is to do that. 
Because he's going to answer you. And we're talking about we're talking about old dreams that maybe that haven't come true and all and visions and so on and so forth. I have, and when it says here, not write the vision, doing that, but I want you to notice here, uh, for still the vision waits for the appointed time. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it, it will surely come. This is one thing if you ever see modeled out of me in this ministry, it's that one. And I'll tell you what I mean is, is I have a promise from God over 30 years ago what he's going to do in my ministry. And when I talk about the streets being filled with worshipers, I know what it looks like to you. Now, you have to agree I'm right, because scripturally, we're supposed to be, we can believe that the streets are filled with worshipers, that the dead are raised, and that cripples are walking, blind eyes. Yeah, it's in the book. Yeah, I'm not supposed to argue with pastor about it, but we've been hearing you talk about this for 25 years. And yay, you've seen some spotty things once in a while. But how many years are you going to stand up there and say the streets are filled with worshipers, that we're going to have glass cases of look what the Lord has done all around the perimeter of whatever property we have with all the crutches and all the wheelchairs. Pastor, how long are you going to talk about that when you don't see it? It doesn't matter how long because it's got an appointed time and though it's it's slow, it's surely going to come. Amen. See, I'm not going to be kneel and give it up on me. And again, he's done some really cool, we've had some really cool miracles through the years just to say you're on the right track. It's really out there. But having, being a person of destiny, it can be a curse because you're constantly saying and declaring because you know you need to and people are like, you're smoking crack. No one's doing this. Don't you know you build a church because of your marketing? Don't you know your church is built because, because you're cool? I don't want to be cool. I want to be anointed. I want to be anointed. And, this, and these kinds of anointings don't come right away. And those kinds of deliverers. Now, notice I said plural. God doesn't operate with Moses anymore. We're all sons of God. All right, so let me clarify. But those kinds of graces like John Lake had or Smith Wigglesworth had or Amy Simple McPherson or Catherine Coleman, they might come once in a generation. And the things folks go through to carry that, and especially in New England, most of you know some of the things that, oh, and I had another real, real quick lesson on prophecy and how things work. I've had... If I lay, when I lay hands on you and I say, you know, the Lord's sharing this with me, X, Y, and Z, and I, even though I know I'm, I just, at this time, I just know I'm right. But I'll ask, think about that. If I've ministered to you, I'll, I will specifically ask in these, you know, basically these terms, does this make sense to you? Does this bear witness to you? And where I'm going with that is, and why I brought that up, is um, you can have an oak tree that's a foot tall, and someone can come and begin to talk to that oak tree, let's just say a, someone who, a horticulturist, and say, you know what? You're going to be 80 feet tall one day. And you're going to make these things called acorns. And you're going to make a thing called a leaf, and it's really, really green. Now, the one-foot acorn, it has no idea experientially, but in its DNA, it knows exactly who it is, and someone is now defining what's in their heart. If you're a rose bush and someone starts talking to you and calling you an acorn, an oak tree, and things aren't making a mess, in other words, the word of God that comes to you, especially prophetically, is going to bear witness to your DNA and what you already have. You're not going to come up and get something surprised on you. And there's a lot of people that have shipwrecked their faith because someone told them they were going to be the next great deliverer to the nation, and they can't even survive their job at Walmart. Now, the reason why I'm saying that is there have been things through the years by international president ministries that presidents go to, the who's who of Christians go to. There have been things that have been said over my life that are not true because they said it. They explained what was in here, and I didn't necessarily know the nomenclatures before. Gosstown Harvest Christian Church, this ministry is going to touch the nations. We're going to plant churches all over the world. Uh, uh, there's apostolic gifts and powers that we're going to see. I'm not there yet. I'm a foot tall. 
And I said all that to say that that, I have to do that every time I stand before you. I have to constantly balance talking to you from 60 feet tall when I'm only two and a half feet. Not giving this up, but also not trying to act like I got something when I don't have it yet. Now, what, what I'm doing, and I've led you up to, understand, another coaching moment, why I went into all that. If it seems slow, wait for it. Learn from me, my friends. One of the most important lessons we must learn in dealing with God is determining times and seasons. As well, not quitting is paramount if we are going to experience those dreams he has placed in our heart. And then notice there's an infinite difference between a godly dream and a whim. And I want to encourage you today. You might not know how, and you're watching uh, by live stream, and you have those, you know you're going to be 60 feet tall, but everything around you is, it reminds me, I just looked at somebody. Have you guys ever heard of a guy by the name of Joseph in the Old Testament? Yeah, he was a dreamer, man. I mean, God put some things in his heart, and every time he thought he was going to go somewhere, he ended up in a pit. Those closest to him were the ones who tossed him there. He finally gets a really good management position. Then he gets betrayed and thrown in prison. Then he does pretty good in prison. Then something happens. People forget about him. He ends up in prison again. But when the times and seasons were fulfilled, everything and more that God had put in his heart came true. <coughs> and the nation of Israel exists today because Joseph fulfilled the dream that God gave him. And that nation was preserved in Egypt for those next 400 years until it was time. Okay, you've been in the womb of Egypt. It's now time for you to have your own. How many nation changers have given up what God has called them to do because they've not understood these principles. There's Neils out there complaining they don't have a weenie whistle because, and this is such an important lesson to learn on how God functions in his kingdom, times and seasons. And those, those, those issues in your, the, that's not right, those, the characteristics, those hungers in your DNA that are there that God's put in you, it doesn't matter how many gray hairs you have now. It doesn't matter that you have no gray hairs. Trust, cooperate, and just ref, above anything else, refuse to quit and give up what you know that God has made you to experience. Parents, that goes for your kids. Don't, go, don't worry about your kids. I mean, you're going to worry about them, but listen... You know, I've said through the years, God did not have me birth children that are going to go to hell. Like, that's imp it's inconceivable to think that that's going to happen. And I would say, listen, the generation of the upright is going to be blessed. My descendants inherit the land. They re-inhabit desolate places. My children were brought into this earth. Wow, these are bad times. I don't think I want to have any kids. You need to have 10. You need to have 10. Okay, because if you're living right in God, okay, your children are born to re-inhabit desolate places. Those areas the enemy has destroyed, you brought kids into the earth because they're going to re-inhabit them with the glory of God. And we've got some desolate places right now, at least in the United States. So don't give up on the faithfulness of God towards your children. It remind me of uh, my pastor. Pastor Dave Roberson tells a story one time. And uh, there's this woman, old woman, just faithful, faithful to God. And uh, she uh, had been believing God her entire life for her children, just believing God, believing God, just wouldn't give it. Well, she got real, real sick and was ready to die. And she was in the hospital. And the doctor's like, we don't get why she's alive. And uh, she was just, she was in a, in a coma, if I remember the story quite, I know she was out, but she was just quietly praying in the spirit, just praying in tongues, praying in tongues, praying in tongues. Well, her children had all come to uh, be with her around when she passed, right? And Pastor Dave, he, he leaned over and he listened to her and, and God gave him the interpretation. Don't tell me the gifts of the Spirit passed away to the apostles. I'll punch your freaking lights out, preacher, if you do this. We need the gifts. And so many people have been hurt because they're not learning about a supernatural God that meets people where they're at today. So he leans over to, and I, I will punch you in love. 
<laughs> a Taekwondo instructor. I still got one good fight left in me. <laughs> I'll probably go to a chiropractor for a month later. Oh, God. But it felt so good to beat up that unbeliever. So it's, anyway, he, he leaned over, and uh, the Lord gave him his, the interpretation. And he said, and the family was there, he said, uh, what she's praying is one of her children are here, and you don't know God, and she told God she will not come home until you meet Jesus. And it was one of the sons. And he came up and he said, that's me. <laughs> wow. And he did. He accepted the Lord right there. And he leaned over to his mom and he said, Mom, I've just asked Jesus in my heart. You can go home now. Gone. She went home. Amen. But you give up on your children. There aren't too many teachers. You guys in here, you are chained to God's destiny. You can try to break out of it all you want. You can't. Because you got believe in parents. I'd pick on other teenagers. You're just the only ones I see. Oh no, there you are. You're chained. I don't want to feel anybody left out. And you know what? Your parent, I, 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 I made a lot of mistakes as a parent. Don't, don't hold God to the same level you hold your parents. Okay? Don't let them mess up what you can have in God. And so, yeah, he leaned over. He says, Ma, I've just asked Jesus into my heart. And she went right home. Gone. That's the power we carry if we don't give. That woman was not going to go home to be with Jesus till she knew every one of her children. This is the power we carry with our Father. Oh my gosh, the authority we have. But it's godly dreams, not a whim. Let's keep going. How are we doing? Good? Psalm 37, 34. This is, a, uh, this, is a, this is an important one. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. That's more than ever before I am learning to enjoy my pastures, not try to go get new ones right now. I've shared with you guys before. He said to me, it was a number of years ago. That wasn't that long ago, I guess two, three years ago. He said, you've missed out on many of my blessings because you didn't know how to enjoy the victories I gave you. You kept wanting more and more and more, and you missed out on the people and the blessings. You believed me all those years to get something done. You get them, and then you're not even enjoying the mountaintop because you want to go do something else. Yeah. I'm determining not to do that because I understand times and seasons. So I'm enjoying, say, I'm enjoying, and now, and after, because I've done a lot of overseas trips and stuff like that, I can honestly say, as a captain, I would have no problem getting any of us over to Europe. I mean, that's the level I'm at. No problem. I'm enjoying those pastures. Let's go. <laughs> All right. I'm enjoying those pastures. I'm enjoying going home and not having 50 businesses to run in and churches and plants and all that. That's going to change one day. But this is really, really great. And I want to encourage you to learn from me. Instead of thinking about what you don't have or what you have to get done, go home this season, go home even today, and just look around and go, you know what? God is just really, really good. Take a chill pill and just relax and go, man, I'm just going to dwell and enjoy safe pasture. But here's what I want to, t I want to hit, and this is really big. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you what? The desires of your heart. Those weenie whistles that are on the inside of you. Now, two things I've learned. This is a one coin, two sides. Sir Certainly, there are desires that we have on the inside of us. He, we're all in, individuals before him as his children. There's different passions. There's things we, that we like that bless us. Uh, flying a challenger probably isn't going to do much for you, but doing multimedia and all this other stuff that you're really good at and what you love to do is very different from... Well, God knows those desires, and he wants to grant them. Well, the other side, and I've actually... I lean more on this other side of the coin. If I delight myself in the Lord, he gives me the desires of my heart, I I've learned it's a whole lot easier to walk with God and know his will because if I'm living right, the desire I have, he put there. It's grown past, I want a, I want a new car, I want a new car, I want a new car. It's to, I check the desire, and I find actually he's the one who put that thing there in the first place, and it's on its way. Now, this is really important about delight in the Lord, and those of us who've been brought up in church, and I'm going to use the term religion here, I use the term religion, religion in, in context is what any system of trying to serve God, not out of relationship, but by behavior. 
Okay, so that's, that's, the, that's the definition. When I use the term religion here, that's the definition I, I, I want us to have in our head. And coaching moment, it says, take delight in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. God is not a slot machine. He told Abraham that I, God, am your exceeding great reward. As we grow, it will become increasingly clear that the greatest gift is God himself. And that we are to enjoy him most of all. Religion doesn't teach us that at all. So many of us have concentrated on being good and then the resultant badness in our life as a result of failure that we know little and have a serious lack of skill on how to enjoy our God. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of, of your heart. We have been brought up in church, in religion, so many of us, that our acceptance, our confidence before God, and whether he would enjoy us or we would enjoy him, is so behaviorally driven, not grace-given. Now, I'll put this in there, don't forget. Grace does not necessarily mean approval. Just because he graces you and forgives you in a season in your life doesn't mean he's happy about it. Yeah. Okay? But what happens is, if we're to the degree that we are, I'm a good person, bad person, but trust me, you're going to continually have the filter of, I'm a bad person. I'm a bad person, and I didn't meet up, and God can't possibly be happy with me. If this is, what is, if this is what's going through your spiritual DNA right now, it's going to be difficult, if not impossible, to do simply delight yourself and have fun and enjoy God. When God said to Abraham, he said, look, Abraham, I'm going to give, as a result of your faithfulness and not quitting, I'm giving you nations, man. You're going to have so much money. You don't know how to do it. You're going to have lands. You're going to have nations. You're going to have peoples. But he said, Abraham, most importantly, I'm your reward. Me. Me, being with me, there's nothing better than being in my presence where pleasures forevermore and riches and blessings are at my right hand and my left. Being with God is our great, delighting ourselves in him more than anything else. And this is how, the, when we talk about um, Jesus' sayings on, on talents and prosperity and things like this, this is where the Apostle Paul learning to be content comes in. You can still say, I don't make enough money, and yet be content when you don't know what you're going to do to pay the electric bill. Because when you delight now in God himself, contentment comes from, I have my reward right here. I have his presence. I have his joy. When was the last time you th really thought about God is a person you're to enjoy rather than serve or get your head beat in? And yet you don't say there's no other God, or there's no other father that Jesus introduced us to. There's no other father that the apostles introduced us to. This is who he is. And I'm determining more than ever, and especially in the season, I'm just going to delight myself in God. I'm just going to delight. I just want to be with him. I just want to laugh with him. I appreciate what he's going to say, but he's my reward. I'm going to delight myself in him. And once I do, number one, selfish desires go away, because what do you want next to when you have his pleasure? Second of all, you're going to find you have his pleasure. So what can I do for you today? Just like any good dad. Just like any good dad. Okay, last one, last two verses. I quoted this on our video last week. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? He was talking to me a couple weeks ago, and, uh, and he said to me, he says, to the degree that you understand my love demonstrated through my love for the son and his love for me is to that degree you'll understand my heart. He who did not spare his only son, he's never been separated from his son. They exist loving in exchange for another. The only illustration I can come up with is what would the son feel like if somehow you could take scissors and cut off light and separate the two. 
when Jesus had sin come upon him. And he says, why have you forsaken me? The love of the Father towards us was such is that he gave up the person he has loved and projected out of himself forever and ever. And he allowed himself to be separated because of his love for us. And Jesus so loved the Father that the will of the Father was paramount. And he allowed himself to be separated even from the very source of his existence because he loved the Father so much. And if the Father and Son, through the power of the Spirit, would do that to each other because of their love, how is he not going to graciously give us all things? This God, there's no one like God. They're counterfeits. They're all counterfeits. And by the way, and term Trinity is not something for theologians to argue. It's the simplest explanation of God. And so many principles we learn from him cannot be unless there's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. If the Father whom he has loved from before the creation of the world would be separated for the sake of us. He so loved the world that in giving his own son, he was separated from him. He was cut off from his own son. And the son was cut off from his very existence that he's known forever and ever and ever, never been. He's the Alpha and the Omega, just like the Father. He loved his father, loves his father so much that that will was more important to him than anything he would personally want in his own desires. See, we got to start learning about this love Father, Son, Holy Spirit have. But if he'll do that because he loves you, how will he not graciously give us all things? What a father. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son, and forgave our sins. I love this. He, sh- he has showered, Lord, we would use also use the word lavished, his kindness on us. One more time. He's so rich in kindness and grace. Is this the God you know? Yeah. Do you delight in him? Yeah. This is who you're supposed to delight in. Not someone who's beating your head in. Okay, because dad told you you were going to hell. And preacher's kids, this is, I was on flight for two and a half hours. Well, we flew 16 hours in two days. But preacher's kids, man, you get, it's, sometimes it's the worst. Not in the Johnson household. They get these standards, they rules. you got to obey, you got to obey. And then here's the thing. Then they, they see you at home. That's what I was talking to with my friend. And their parents become their God, and they know very little about the one true God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, who is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his Son. He forgave us our sins. He has lavished his kindness on us. Lavish means sumptuously rich, elaborate, or luxurious. Extravagant. Got a picture, and we're done. Maybe we'll see this this year. I don't think it's this year. He has showered his kindness on us. When we understand that this is how God acts towards us with all of his favor, and don't forget, he's our dad, we will have the perfect ground for the dreams, those seeds at first, to cultivate and produce incredible goodness beyond our imagination. God lavishes his kindness on us. That's what it means to pour out lavishly. Is, that, is this the God you delight in? See, if you don't, it's difficult to want to delight in a God who's not like that. How could you delight in a God you don't know that's how he is? You know, you'd be doing one of these jobs. Well, they used to after the old covenant, but now under the new covenant. The, law, the technology, I was talking to someone the other day. I said, well, what about... Uh, uh, you know, should I read the old covenant? Should I, you know, I, in Genesis and all, and you know, I want to read the prophets and all this. It's like, not yet. 
because it's old technology. We don't serve him under that technology anymore. We have new technology. I don't have to enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart and his courts with praise. I don't have to do that anymore because the curtain's already been torn down. I come into his presence in full assurance of faith. That's the only thing I need. And I'm smack dab in my father's face. Glory to God. That's old technology. I got new technology. How do you get more intimate with God than being in Christ and seated together with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus? I don't blow any kind of horn. I just lift my hands and get sensitive to what's already true. I'm in him. Hey, Dad, how we doing? Because I approach him with full assurance of faith because the curtain's been pulled and I have bold access to my God. Boldness is something I need, not a horn. An assurance of faith that that blood is speaking for me. It's done. It's done. It's done. Well, if we just pray more, it's done. If I just worship more, I got to break through. How do I have to break through if I'm already in union with Him? The only thing you're trying to do is get your soul aligned, but don't think a minute just because you're so flipping dull because you watch TV 40 hours this week that you have to break through to anything to be with God. No, it's your own carnality that you got to subdue. It isn't the reality of your relationship and union with Him. It's old technology. And it's mind-boggling as you discover it. Shall we pray? <laughs> Father, in Jesus' name, I'm going to delight in you. You're so good. Amen. You're so good. You're so good, Father. I just worship you. I thank you, Father. You're so good. You're so good. Oh, you're so good. And I just bless you. I praise you. I thank you. You are my exceeding great reward. You've given me some cool stuff. But, Father, at the end of the day, way beyond. It's your presence I want more than anything else. Father, I thank you. I have free access to you. If there's any dullness in me, I don't have to break through anything. There's no breaking through anything. I'm in you. The blood has bought my way. Now, I might have things I got to take care of because of my carnality, but I am in union with you. The blood has set me free. I have boldness and accents with confidence to come before you. And I want to thank you, Father, that I'm at home when I'm with you. And so, Father, I'm going to pray for everybody here in this room, those who are watching my live stream, that um, hope, faith was stirred back up, that the, the weenie whistles, that all of us, and whether it was three years old through our parents, through teachers, through other ministers maybe, <clears throat> whatever it is that's called us, that, <clears throat> that snapped our ability to believe, Father, I'm asking and now declaring healing in this room and healing to anybody who watches the service. That a glimmer of, of faith and hope will result from today. And so, Father, I just declare the folks in here blessed, confident, awake again, and that going into 2022, there'll be great expectation, great expectation in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, this is Pastor Joe again, and I trust that you enjoyed our service. I believe that you learned more about God, you learned more about His kingdom, that you understand more of His Word. And at the end of the day, what makes that amazing is we can walk more close with our God and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So if there's anything we can do to serve you, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Of course, our Sunday morning services are at 10 o'clock. Our information is on the website. Please make sure you check it out. And I'm going to look forward to seeing you, serving you, journeying together with you in this generation to see the goodness of God now and forever and ever. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you real soon.